Hello and, and welcome. Yes, I'm Peter Ashman. I'm the chairman of ALPS, CEO at BMJ. And uh, on behalf of ALPS, I want to welcome all of you to this, the 10th anniversary conference um, of uh, ALPSP, and the first one to be held outside the UK. So a big momentous moment for, for ALPS as well. I'd also like to welcome anybody who's here for the first time uh, as well. I know we have lots of first time attendees. And also I'd like to welcome anybody who's actually got here, uh, because I think, uh, you know, I know how much trouble everybody's had uh, today and still lots of people are uh, still arriving. So thank you to Audrey and her excellent uh, ALPS team for organising the conference and also to the programme committee who have put together uh, a conference, I think, that will, um, will challenge you, inform you and hopefully entertain you as well. Thanks to our speakers for giving up their time and for sharing their insights. And also thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, we're really grateful to your sponsors, because to the sponsors, because it really does um, help us make this conference uh, work very well. So thank you for that. Um, I've got some, oh yes. No, I've got some housekeeping in a minute, but just to uh, tell you what the order of the day is. In, in a moment, I'll be introducing, introducing our um, uh, keynote speakers and at the end of that we'll take questions after both people have spoken. Um, so as well as the programme we've got drinks receptions this evening and drink reception tomorrow evening followed by uh, the awards dinner and uh, where we're going to be presenting the Alps Award for Innovation in Publishing and a very special award to an individual who's made a major contribution to scholarly publishing. And that will be followed by the world famous Richard Geddes um, quiz. If anybody has seen this quiz before and partaken in it, um, you, know, you know what's coming. For those uh, who've been here for the first time, um, it's unfathomable, basically, I think. And, uh, but it's fun, so uh, I know you'll, you'll enjoy it. Uh, what else? Housekeeping. I'm under instructions to tell you about certain things. Emergency exits are that way. There is no fire uh, drill planned, so if it goes off, you know, it's for real. Um, Wi-Fi, thank you to uh, Ares, who have sponsored the Wi-Fi for us again. Thank you very much indeed, Ares. Uh, the network's Ares, and the password is Ares17. Uh, you'll see that there are cameras around, so most of the sessions are going to be recorded, so please be aware of that and be respectful for uh, the people on, on the platform in terms of your uh, comments and questions. And um, if you have any questions in general, please ask the ALPS team. They're here for you, um, and uh, any questions that you've got, they'll be able to, to help you out. There's, oh, there's the bike ride tomorrow as well. Um, weather permitting <laughs> so there is the sorry it's gonna ha it's gonna happen anyway so um, that's tomorrow evening whether you like it or not so um, <laughs> at the at the end of um, of last year's conference which was um, at Heathrow I announced that we'll be coming to this fantastic venue I think hopefully you really appreciate why it's so special to come here um, but I made a joke uh, because um, I thought it was quite funny at the time, and so did other people, um, because this is the hotel where the American president stays when he comes to um, stay in the Netherlands. And I said, Trump that. Which I thought was funny at the time, because um, at, the, at that moment, nobody, well, everybody thought it was a joke that uh, Trump would become president of the United States. So 12 months on, reality set in, and it's no longer a joke. It's certainly no longer a laughing matter. We live in a world of aggression towards the mainstream media, where the words fake news and alternative facts have entered the mainstream, and where policy is announced by Twitter. And it's not much different, really. In our world, we, we face similar challenges. We live in a world of plagiarism, fraud, copyright breach, content sharing, censorship, and theft. So I think that it's quite apt that we open this year's conference with our two keynote speakers, uh, the dream team on the topic of trust, truth, and scholarly publishing, I think. We couldn't ask for two better speakers. And uh, the, the, your topic is very timely. So I'm going to introduce, I think, um, first Professor Lex Bauter, Professor of Methodology and Integrity at VU University in Amsterdam, who will be followed by Kay Koizumi, visiting scholar 
for Science Policy at the AAAS. Please welcome your keynote speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, and indeed, it's a serious topic we're going to discuss this afternoon in this plenary session. Um, and let me start with two disclaimers. The first one is that I'm an optimistic person. But I think that there are some difficulties in uh, science and we need to fix them. And I also believe that scientific journals should and can play a role in that. Some of the problems are on the slides, my title slides, and they all fell under the heading of research integrity. And the second disclaimer is, sadly, that there is not that much empirical evidence on research integrity, uh, what it is, how common it is, and how we should fix it, which is a shame to some extent, to a large extent. The evidence base, uh, the so-called meta-research, is growing. We do have some granting programs both in the European Uni Union and in the Netherlands now and in some other countries, but it's weak. So I must admit that a lot of what I have to say is not really founded on solid science. So be warned. What I will do is first uh, explain a little bit about the arena of research integrity and I will try to explain why I believe that sloppy science, questionable research practices, are much more important than the real full-blown research misconduct labeled as FFP in North America, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. And not because that's not so awful, plagiarism, falsification, fabrication, but because the cutting corners, the minor misbehaviors are so awfully common. And on the aggregate, they will harm science much more. Further, I will zoom in on one of the issues I consider really uh, important and also appropriate for, for this audience, namely selective reporting, why that is one of the most important causes probably of the current replicability crisis we are facing, and then I'll move on to the uh, treatment, namely more transparency, and I try to outline what journals and publishers and editors can do to enable more transparently, not only nudging, but by making it mandatory as well. But let's first agree that breaches of research integrity indeed can be harmful. The first victim typically is the truth. Uh, the validity of knowledge suffers when research is corrupted, but also trust, trust in science in the general public, but also trust between scientists. And that's awful, because we need to be able to trust each other. Uh, like Isaac News Newton already said, we need to stand on the shoulders of the guidance that came before us. And when you are not able to trust your colleagues anymore, you don't know whether the knowledge you are using is solid enough to be used. And maybe more importantly, the secondary sequelae of breaches of research integrity might be more important. It's waste, bad research, corrupted research, fraud in research. It's a waste of money. But also, it's a waste of animals and humans when you have animal or human participants in your research. It's unethical, in other words. Bad research is always unethical, of course. And then, some people apply research in society, in nature conservation, in economy, and also in healthcare. And when the research is not as good as, as, as it could have been, there will be damage there as well. So it is serious business. And typically when someone is lecturing on research integrity, you get a slide like this. That on, on the top you see that's how it should be responsible conduct of research to do your utmost best to do relevant, valid and efficient studies. You may make mistake, mistakes and you might be wrong, of course, but you do your utmost best and you're there for science and not for yourself. Yeah? 
a, a, a source of difficulties is, is that what is good for your own career, career is not always good for science at large, but you're there for science. And at the bottom, you see the FFP I mentioned before, uh, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. And in the middle, um, to my taste, that is the most interesting part. That is the arena of uh, questionable research practices, of sloppy science, or you could say of cutting corners, doing things less good than they should be done. Ignorance can be a source of sloppy science. Also, it can be an honest error, but it can also become dubious integrity. And we see a few examples of that in, in this lecture. When you are cutting corners, because you know it will be good for your career and it will be not so good for truth finding, you are already on the slippery slope of research integrity. Now, one might wonder how common are these things? And here is some research. It's, it's not fantastic, but there are 21 surveys have been done asking basically the same question to scientists. Did you, in the last three years, commit at least once plagiarism, falsification, fabrication, or one of this list of minor uh, misbehaviors? It's self-reported, surveys. It's probably a gross underestimation. And the average result is uh, they left out plagiarism, um, falsification and fabrication. 2% of these people admit it. When you realize that when you are working in a department of 50 colleagues, on average one of them not only did one of these two bad things, but is also willing to admit it. And that's probably an underestimation. But when you look at the questionable research practices, you see that's not an exception anymore, that is a rule. And, and there are more recent surveys that approach 60, 70, 80 percent of people admitting to questionable research practices. So that is the elephant standing there in the corner of the room uh, we have to talk about. This is a study we did uh, a few years ago with the purpose to rank different forms of misbehavior. 60 form of misbehaviors. What we did is we surveyed all the participants to one of the four world conferences on research integrity. The fifth one was in May in Amsterdam and there this stuff was presented as well. We asked all these experts, self-declared experts, uh, about every behavior. How often do you think this occurs? And if it occurs, how bad is it? What is the impact on validity of knowledge or truth in science? And then, of course, you can multiply these things with each other and make a ranking out of it. I'm not going to present the whole ranking. If you're interested, uh, please read the paper. But I give you a few salient um, uh, results of it. It turned out that elements of selective reporting selective citation, flaws, serious flaws in research quality, and also, maybe most importantly, flawed supervision. That was on the top of all the rankings we could make, and we make, made several, uh, of course. When you look at the deadly sins of research misconduct, then you see that fabrication and falsification correctly rank high on impact on validity, but on the product terms, when you multiply it with estimated frequency, they come to the middle range. So they're not in the top five, they're not in the top 10, they're not in the top 20, as far as the impact on science as a whole is concerned. And plagiarism is ranking low on impact of truth. If something is right and you say it again, it's still right, and if something is wrong and you say it again, it's still wrong no matter whether the citation is correct, but it has an impact on trust. That's, that's clear. So it, it came higher in the trust ranking, but it was nowhere in the truth rankings. So this is the best evidence I can offer for my idea that sloppy science is on the average more important than FFP. And one might wonder, what are the causes? What are the causes of researchers misbehaving 
Um, there might be causes in the system of science, there might be uh, causes in the individual itself, in the scientist, and in the local climates, in the laboratory, in the group when, where someone is, is working. Um, again, there is some evidence, but not that much. Uh, in the system of science, it is quite clear that perceived organizational injustice uh, lets people to cut corners, or worse. And also, when they perceive the likelihood of being caught when misbehaving is low, which is the case, uh, then the tendency to misbehavior uh, increases. And when you talk to criminologists, they always say the same, surprise, surprise, the rewards are so high for misbehaving in science and the likelihood of being caught is almost zero. And there's still humans there, so you need to police them maybe a little bit more. On the level of the individual, uh, norm subscription is probably important. When your set point uh, is, is, is really ethical, you want to do the good thing, that makes a difference. And, and when your tendency is to cut corners, you will also cut corners in science. Work pressure is an aggravating factor and also dependency on external uh, funding. In, in my country, like in many other countries, many scientists depend fully on the next grant uh, and that is an, a very, very strong incentive to misbehave uh, to some people. Uh, it's not an excuse to misbehave, but it puts an awful lot of pressure on these people. And looking at the local climate, you could say that norm adherence in the group, and there is some research uh, supporting that, is much more important than norm adherence in the individual. When you see around you in the lab all types of misbehavior, and you perceive that this is the norm to, to do it uh, in, in improper ways, you will do so yourself as well. The tendency will be very high. When there is a lot of competition um, and when there is bad mentoring, no mentoring or mentoring for survival. And by that is meant mentoring to get publications and citations, uh, mentoring that is good for your career and not good for science. That makes things worse. Social support is important as a preventive factor and perceived injustice in the group, in the department, um, it is an aggravating factor, like, uh, again, likelihood of detection by the colleagues around you. And, and this is how it might work. There is not that much research on this, but it's quite plausible. We all know that positive, spectacular results are wonderful. They're wonderful because you can publish them easily in high-impact journals, they bring you a lot of citation, they bring you media attention, they make you famous, and all these things help you to get the next grant and to get tenure in the long run. So it's really important to have positive results. And now the good news in a cynical way is that all forms of research misbehavior, the, the major and the minor ones, can really help you to get positive results. These are, of course, then false positive results, but they are wonderful to get positive results. And there are many, many examples in the literature. And then your personal interest, and sometimes also the sponsor interest, nudge you in the direction of misbehaving. And that led to wrong situations and also to selective reporting, of course. I'd like to recommend this article, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. It's about researcher degrees of freedom. It's about all the possibilities, and they list uh, 34, uh, all the possibilities you have as a researcher to spin your stuff and to make it look more beautiful and more spectacular and more positive than it is, in fact. Wonderful. And the, the, the writers, they say, well, we should restrict ourselves and the system should restrict these degrees of freedom. Because negative results uh, bring you nothing, many people don't bother anymore to publish them. And that's what you get. That is selective citation. Non-publication, studies that are not published at all because the results were not interesting enough uh, to be published in the view of people, or selective uh, reporting being cherry-picking. Only the spectacular cherries 
out of a sea of uninteresting results in, in the eyes again of investigators. And that leads, leads of course, to flawed meta-analysis, to flawed systematic reviews. When you see not the part of the iceberg which is negative, you get the impression when you summarize the literature um, that is more positive than it is in reality when you could have together all the results. And when you have a lot of false positive results that are being published, the problem is, of course, these are not easily replicated. That's an issue as well. And I'll give you one ex spectacular example. Nature 2012, it is in the field of animal research, um, and the idea was of, of this group, uh, can we replicate animal studies in oncology that identified new chemotherapeutic entities that we might try on humans. Serious stuff. Important studies. They selected 56, 53 important studies uh, that were widely cited, that whole laboratory were following up, and so on and so forth. And the question was, can we do it again and get the same result? And they tried everything. They used the original protocol, they went to the original labs if necessary, they let the original researchers do the work if necessary, they tried everything. And what happened? Only six, only six out of 53 they were able to replicate. That's a bloody shame. It's, it's wasteful uh, and, and it's also unethical because many of these not replicable studies were already in phase one trials, in first in man studies, and, and the stuff was tried out on really sick cancer patients. So it's a bloody shame. And this led, and, and now the optimistic person comes, comes along again, this led to rapid changes in the field of animal research. They started publishing protocols, they started doing systematic reviews, they're starting uh, conferences on core outcome measures to make it more uh, meta-analyzable, the stuff they were doing, um, and they wrote reporting guidelines uh, how to report a study to enable a colleague to replicate it. So wonderful things happened there. I just returned from Chicago from the peer review conference and there it was made visible again how fast this uh, research arena of animal research is moving in the right direction and this is what it starts, this study and a few more. When you go to other fields, typically between 10 and 80% is replicable. It's, it's, it's not clear why these differences are there, we have some clues, but there is a big, big replicability crisis. Um, and this is a slide from a report um, um, a draft report still, I should say, uh, of the Royal Society of Arts and Sciences in the Netherlands, and we try to figure out what could be the most important causes of not being reproducible of research. Uh, selective reporting, uh, what I alluded to earlier, is an important one, and also the perverse incentives in the reward system. When you learn people that the only thing that counts is being cited, uh, you give the message that only behavior that is leading you to more citations is worthwhile in science. So there are perverse incentives there. The therapy. The therapy might be, and many people think so, more transparency. More transparency. And by transparency, we nowadays mean the following, that you register your study before you start, that you finish and upload your research protocol before you start, that you publish after the data are collected a log of what happened during data collection, that you have a data analysis plan which is fixed and uploaded and cannot be changed anymore without leaving traces. Uh, before you start looking at your data, you publish your syntaxes of data analysis, uh, you make completely clear what the conflict of interests are of the research team, you make clear what the amendments were, uh, what, what the things were, you change in your study and your data analysis along the way, 
because people then know that they might be data driven and then you publish your data set and you publish all your results. That is the ideal world. And there is some discussion possible, of course, and there is still some discussion, uh, not about that this should be done and it should be done prospectively, that's obvious, but whether it should also be done publicly. And my simple statement about that is not always. There are good reasons not to make it public or to delay it or make it public conditionally and so on and so forth. I will not dwell on that. Maybe in question time we will dwell on that. So I'm not advocating full open access and full open data. I'm advocating prospective transparency as good as possible. And nowadays there are systems for that, the open science framework, Dataverse, many journals offer f facilities for digital supplements and many journals offer possibilities to upload protocols before you start your data collection. There are some conditions, of course, for transparency. You need the skills, the system and the facilities. Some months of embargo might be a good idea. Uh, when other people use your data, there should be proper acknowledgements, of course. Uh, maybe you should give the principal investigator of the original data collection an opportunity to participate. Um, and we need, and that's not easy, uh, guarantees against breaches of uh, identity protection and misuse of the data by people who want to misuse your data. And then again, the circle starts all over again. When someone wants to use your data, you need to see a protocol, what they're going to do with it before it's being done. The same rules apply again, of course. When you want to learn more about transparency and also the disadvantages of, of several aspects of that, I recommend these 10 commentaries in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, uh, short pieces, and they cover basically the whole ground uh, when you're interested in empirical research. It, then do not deal with qualitative research, but one way or the other, the same rules apply. Let's assume that we need and want to promote transparency. And then the question arises, how can we do that? We, can, we should be aware, like I said before, that we should not make the citation the only frequent flyer mile in science. That is what we did so far. We need to broaden that. We also need to reward uh, publishing of protocols, publishing of negative results, so to say. And we also need to reward data sharing because it's, it's a lot of work to prepare a data set uh, and to make it usable for someone else and to upload it somewhere. Taking part in replication. Uh, we need to strike a better balance between innovation and replication in science and we need to reward people who replicate studies. That's not the case. Many journals don't publish replications and many funding agencies have no opportunity, granting opportunity for replications. That needs to change probably. And also dissemination and application of findings needs to be visible as good behavior by scientists and should be rewarded. These are things that institutions can do, and to some extent also granting agencies. What we also can do is to withdraw permission when people do not promise that they will be transparent in the way just described. That can be done by institutional review boards, by other types of ethic committees, or by boards of institutions. Funders, and there are many examples of that already, can demand transparency and specify what they mean by that uh, as a condition for the last 10 or 20 percent of the grant. And that really works. Me people understand money. Really, they do. You can also say you're not eligible for the next grant application when you have not been transparent in your past grant applications. So fix that first and then come back again to us. Makes it easy. And then, of course, Journals, and that's you, journals can make transparency uh, mandatory. Uh, you probably all know, I, I, I didn't, didn't even make a slide out of that, because I, I know you, you will know the transparency and openness promotion 
guidelines. I believe these are wonderful. Journals can pick their stance on, on these guidelines and the idea is to make it so as transparent as, as possible in, in, in many ways. And it's a really good idea to make it more transparent. Uh, I just told you, I, I'm, I just arrived this morning from Chicago, from the peer review conference. Many people are there, many journals present, are so committed now to making science more transparent and playing their role uh, there. Journals can get their act together and can take responsibility for that. Uh, when you want a kind of summary of what is important to enable more uh, uh, replicability, this is a beautiful article. The, the, there is a table in it and everything that should and can be done is visible in the table and many stuff can be done by publishers and editors of journals as well. Um, and what I like very much is this simple idea of registered reports. It's being designed in social sciences, it's being picked up in biomedical sciences and natural sciences nowadays. And the idea is so simple that when you want to do a study, you write an introduction and a method paragraph and you send it to a journal. And the journal says, well, this is interesting because we think it's relevant and we think that the methods are sound. When you do this, we are going to publish it uh, with a few minor conditions about quality of reporting, of course. And then the journal cannot be distracted in their decision to publish by the results of the studies because there are no results of the studies and that kills all the likelihood of selective reporting. It's a really good idea. And it enables the prospective transparency I just uh, uh, advocated before. In conclusion, I believe that selective reporting is a real threat for validity and efficiency of science. It, it's probably the major problem we are facing today in empirical sciences. That it led us to the replicability crisis, which is currently there, and, and every week it's in the Dutch newspaper still, the replicability crisis, science, nature, all the big journals are writing about it all the time, um, and many disciplines are increasingly getting their act together. It's really happening, and you as publishers and editors and journal uh, people can help. More transparency, uh, it's urgently needed. I'm not going to say that it's a magic bullet and it will solve all the problems, but it's really important. And to have more transparency, we need to fix the reward system. There's really something wrong with the reward system in science. That's not going to be easy, but many people share the diagnosis and there are good ideas for the therapy there. Uh, we need multiple stakeholders, scientists and institutions first and foremost, funding agencies, journals, uh, professional organization. We all need to help to fix the problems that scientists are facing nowadays to make science better uh, because science is important uh, for the future of all of us. And that is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Uh, so I'm Kei Koizumi, and I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different because I'm a little bit different uh, from your previous speaker. Uh, so my charge to you today is to talk about how science funding and policy in the United States is changing now as a result of the president that's already been mentioned, uh, and uh, what editors, scientific societies, and publishers can do to rebuild public trust in science at a time when the foundations of science are under threat, not only in the United States, but also uh, across the globe. So as an introduction, let me tell you a little bit more about where I'm coming from. Uh, so where I'm coming from is literally the White House. Uh, so for eight years, I was uh, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Which eight years? The eight years in which President Obama was president. Um, so I worked for uh, the man on the left, uh, who, who, who is John Holdren, President Obama's science advisor, uh, who in turn worked for the man on the right, whom you know. Uh, so uh, our mission at the OSTP 
was twofold. One was to, to give the president and U.S. policymakers the best available scientific advice on any matters in which science and technology advice would be useful. And the second main mission was to make sound science and technology policies for the U.S. science and technology enterprise. So I think we did that. Uh, and, well, behind this uh, website is a lot of information, a lot of advice and information that we provided, much of it which came from the research literature, from the published research that U.S. and international scientists have been contributing to our knowledge base of what, of the natural world, the social world, et cetera. Um, it is a new world now. Uh, this is what that page looks like now. There's this big white blank spot. Um, so it is a new world. Uh, the, the new administration, I think, is a sign of crumbling trust in institutions of all varieties, including scientific institutions. Crumbling trust in and reliance on expertise of all kinds, including scientific expertise, and a diminished role for evidence, data, and knowledge of the kind that, of course, you publish in public policymaking and public decisions. So, you know, that blank page pretty much shows you, shows me all that I need to know. I can tell you that eight years ago, in the first few months of the Obama administration, we were already running at full speed in staffing this institution, contributing scientific expertise to early actions of the Obama administration, and assembling and communicating scientific evidence that policymakers needed in 2009 and the years that followed. So one important area, and you know, my primary responsibility was to look at US government funding of research and development and trying to keep that strong. In contrast to 2009, when we did our, our best with the economic stimulus package and regular US government budgets to increase, dramatically increase government spending in research and development, uh, the, the president's first budget, the one for 2018, tells a very different story. You see deltas between 2017 and 2018 uh, in funding for selected government research funding agencies. They're, all, they're almost entirely minus, as you can see. Fairly, very steep cuts proposed for US government funding of scientific research. And these cuts are not reflective of a general fiscal austerity. Uh, resources are being added, they are be, but they are being directed elsewhere to national security, to homeland security, and to certain entitlement programs. Now, for me, the good news is that so far, the US Congress is rejecting many of these proposed cuts. But the administration appears to still be committed to reducing dramatically the US government's support for science. And that is, of course, particularly painful for me as the former assistant director for federal R&D, um, who was responsible for keeping that US support of scientific research strong. Uh, my mission at OSTP was to keep that red line that you see there as steady as we could in challenging fiscal, fiscal conditions. That red line is U.S. government support of research, not development, but just the basic and applied research as a share of the U.S. economy. Uh, look at that red line again because that is you. Uh, it is you uh, in the sense that Federal government support of research results in the research results that are submitted to your journals as papers. You are publishing the results of that red line. Um, and see what the new administration proposes to do in one year to make an unprecedented cut in that support. And that means, of course, less research, fewer research results, and fewer manuscripts uh, to document the results of that research. Now, the funding situation is obviously important, but I argue that equally important is a change in the status of science in the government. Policymakers, by and large, still believe in the value of most research. So if there are resources available, science will get supported. 
But what is different is that the new world includes not only crumbling government support financially for scientific research, but declining government use of scientific information and other evidence in policymaking, um, and declining support for the value of the U.S. and global scientific enterprise. This picture is just to show, just a visual reminder of where I, where I am now. So I am at, back at the AAAS. I've left the government, or more, more accurately, I think the government left me, um, and uh, I was pushed out. So I am now back at AAAS, a nonprofit science organization in Washington, D.C., and as you know, the publisher of the science family of journals. Uh, so my remarks come today from my current vantage point Point, vantage point as an outside observer of science's place in the U.S. government. So when, when I look at the science community in the United States from, uh, from the nonprofit sector's point of view, many of the signs from the public are encouraging. Public trust of science remains strong. Uh, public literacy in science not so strong, but, you know, but holding stable. But at the, at the government level, and in Washington, D.C., of course, I'm surrounded by the national government, and so it is a very daily uh, phenomenon that I observe, that you know, in the government, government use of and reliance on and trust in science is declining. In the Obama administration, already we saw early signs, so it is not just a function of the current administration. This is a long-term long -term trend that has uh, suddenly you know, caught everyone's attention with the results of last year's election. We saw some signs in what we call the climate wars, the social science wars, the clean energy wars. I'm not going to show a picture, but trust in climate science, the social sciences, some medical sciences, and uh, applied energy research has eroded significantly in the United States. And I will say that that erosion is deliberate and it's politically motivated. The erosion of public trust in these disciplines is a deliberate political strategy by one political party in the United States to undermine the authority of those disciplines and therefore to undermine the role that knowledge from those disciplines plays in setting public policy. Now, why? Because we know that the more we know about the Earth's changing climate, the harder it is to deny that climate change is happening. And the harder it is, of course, to argue against uh, policy measures that would mitigate or adapt to climate change. Uh, people who are politically opposed to policy measures to mitigate or adapt to climate change do not want scientific results saying that climate change is real and that it's anthropogenic. By undermining trust in climate science and climate scientists, they hope to undermine public support for policies to mitigate or adapt to climate change. The same is true, as we found, for the, some of the social sciences. So, because some social sciences tell us some inconvenient truths about how people behave, how people communicate, and how people form attitudes. Those have public policy implications that are not always comfortable for, for, for decision makers. Medical research on controversial topics such as addiction, some forms of human sexuality, uh, the health status of sexual minorities, all of those are uncomfortable for some parts of our policymaking enterprise. And of course, there's clean energy research in which you know, e the economic interests of uh, traditional energy industries are threatened by advances in clean energy research. The danger, as I see it, is that this damage can't be contained. You can't limit the erosion of public trust just to, say, climate science or just to science in the United States. Damaging public trust in climate science will inevitably damage public trust in all science. It will damage trust in and the credibility of the papers you publish. It will devalue your journals. And don't think that you are immune if, for example, you're a physics journal or a biomedicine journal or a Dutch journal. Uh, in the United States, we are seeing this very much in the policymaking sphere under the Trump administration. If the public doesn't insist on 
policy with a scientific foundation, then science-free policies will go forward. Science is decoupling from policy. And that means, of course, that science, as embodied in the papers and the activities of your journals and societies, is being decoupled from influence on public decisions. So we have an administration, of course, that ignores climate science in formulating climate policy. But we also have a government that ignores toxicology research and chemistry in regulating chemicals. A government that pursues economic policies with absolutely no grounding in economics research. A government that willfully disregards social science research on how Americans access and pay for health care. That should worry all of us if the public and policymakers aren't reading your papers, are not inclined to pay attention, then where does that leave you? Where does that leave all of us? And I don't have answers to these questions. So if you're, if you're wondering, yeah, you can stop. <laughs> uh, I'm not equipped to tell the detailed story of other nations either. Though I will say that although the United States appears to be an outlier in degree, much of this eroding trust in science is a global phenomenon. It appears in the, the public opinion polling of other nations as well. So how can societies, editors, and um, scientific organizations rebuild public trust in science? I don't know the full answer to that either, but let me share with you some ways in which I've tried to at least contribute to the effort. One way is through some, what I call scientific integrity. I have long seen that as a key to ensuring public trust in science. So before I go much further, let me make some distinctions. Uh, I'm talking about scientific integrity, which in my talk is distinct from research integrity. Uh, Lex has talked about issues of research integrity, issues relating to reproducibility, replication, and the responsible conduct of science within the science community. Uh, when I talk about scientific integrity, when the US government talks about scientific integrity, that is about the responsible communication of and the use of scientific research results by the government. That is, uh, the use of and communication of scientific results outside the scientific community. And there is a history in the United States of uh, breaches in, of scientific integrity happening in government agencies and occasionally in the White House itself. So when President Obama came in, he made it uh, an early priority to establish a government-wide policy on scientific integrity to ensure that federal agencies listened to science, used science responsibly, responsibly, and communicated about the science they were using as a foundation for their policies in a responsible and transparent manner. That is what the scientific integrity policy that my office in the White House issued was about. So in the, the last administration, I saw um, scientific integrity policy as a key deliverable for the American scientific community to assure American scientific community that their research would be used responsibly by government agencies in setting policy. And we, I thought we were successful by the end of the administration. So this is a posting from December of last year, uh, co-authored by me, in which you know, we basically declared victory that you know, 24 different federal government agencies now had working scientific integrity policies that ensured that federal scientists could, could communicate about their science. The federal agencies had safeguards in place to ensure that when they used science or when they communicated about science that there were standards for how that communication would take place. So far, this scientific integrity is a little bit battered, but it still stands. Uh, and I regard that as a temporary victory. Uh, but I would definitely like to see more of this, have this policy continue and be sustained across the federal science enterprise. And I could talk all day about this, but I think I should move on to the second part, which is to talk about public access to science. 
So let's also talk about public access. Uh, another key policy priority for uh, the Obama White House and its science policies. Now, when I say uh, public access, that is distinct from some of the conversations that we're having about open access. So let me say that public access, when, when used in the US government context, means you know, making the results, the published results in manuscripts and journal articles of federally funded research accessible to the general public within a certain time frame. So it is kind of a narrower, more defined set of issues than the, the open access issue. But the, the aim is the same. We are, it, it is about transparency, as you already heard in the previous, uh, previous presentation. Because we know now that one defense against institutions, governments, and companies hiding the science and hiding inconvenient results or hiding uh, negative results is to push back by making it more open. Now, the US government doesn't have that many tools in that transparency effort, but this is one that the federal government does have. So for public access, again, it was the government-wide policy was issued early in the Obama administration and then it took almost all of eight years to get at, at, the, at the end of the administration, 17 different US government agencies to adopt public access plans. And as shorthand, it, it means extending the public access policy that already existed for the National Institutes of Health to apply to all US science agencies, including the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and others. So the public access plans, again, are moving forward, even in the new administration. And in many ways, the US government is the follower here, as you know, as publishers, because the global open access movement is, is going ahead full steam under its, under its own momentum. You know, from my point of view, uh, the key to trust is robust scientific integrity practices in government and other institutions. The key to truth is ensuring broad and open access to research and research results. They are not the only answers, but from my background in US science policy, they are the ones that I'd like to offer. You know, one other suggestion for how to sustain trust and truth in science is to bring the public, to bring people into science. And that has been another focus throughout uh, my career. So as one example, at, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, we, every day, we try to bring students, teachers, scientists, the general public to the White House to do and learn about science because science is not just for scientists, it is for everyone. Uh, and that is why among the, the many accomplishments of the Obama administration was a reinvigoration, a rethinking of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education as a part of US government policy. Um, and that continues uh, over at AAAS now as well. Um, as some of you know, that AAAS has a program side and a publishing side. So I'm on the program side, and it's been you know, wonderful to see this renewed interest in the American public and of course the worldwide public in science expressed most forcefully and recently in the March for Science, which was a global phenomenon. Um, and what was most heartening for me about the Washington DC March for Science was how many non-scientists participated, how many non-scientists were interested in science, who saw of the important role of science in their lives, in their children's education. And that is something that I think is up to all of us, whether we are inside or outside the government, whether we are inside or outside the United States, to try to bring forward. So uh, in conclusion, thank you for the opportunity to bring you some of my perspectives from uh, across that stormy Atlantic out there. Uh, in sum, you know, this, in this climate, scientific publishers and societies have to be aware of the changes that are happening to US and other government science policies. You also have to constantly keep in mind 
that changes to government policies have a large impact on the global science community that we are all a part of, because we rely on a trusted, truthful scientific enterprise. But both trust and truth can be compromised by government policies. From my experience, we need to worry not only about the easily quantifiable and visible cuts in government funding of research, but also the less tangible erosion of government and public reliance on and trust in research, which I've tried to illuminate based on a couple of American examples. And we all have to worry about the declining role of information, evidence, and knowledge in all spheres of policy making and decision making. So I, as, as I said at the beginning, I don't have the solutions, but I've presented to you some of my ideas and some of the things that I've been working on, which is to fight back against not only funding cuts, but also cuts to scientific capabilities in governments. An idea of working to promote scientific integrity alongside research integrity. Promoting public access to research, especially in government-funded contexts. And finally, to do whatever we all can to link all of our publics to this scientific enterprise. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to Lex and to Kai for absolutely fascinating talk. Twitter has been trying to keep up with you, but there was a comment I saw at the end there that there's just, there's kind of too much information to take in all at once. So if you want to watch it later, we'll be putting the videos up in a couple of weeks or so. So thank you. So for, the, I know there's a lot of new people here. So for those who I haven't met before, my name's Audrey McCulloch and I'm the Chief Executive at Alps and I hope I'll get to see very many of you over the next couple of days. Um, but now, Kai and uh, Lex are, are open to questions, so please raise your hands, and if I can see through the lights, we'll get a microphone to you. Hi there, um, David Smith from the IET. Okay. Um, Lex, I think this question is for you, um, and apologies, because uh, you flew over from Chicago today? Man, that's a journey. I thought mine was bad. Um, oh, it was doable. <laughs> my, my question really yeah. is to challenge. Without, um, I, 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 th I think I support a lot of the things that you have put up about the importance of transparency and stuff. The thing that worries me about the argument that you put forward is the thing around the efficiency. Because it seemed this, this argument seems to be taken that there are inefficiencies in science and your proposals would uh, reduce those inefficiencies and I think my question is and you did allude to it right at the start is I just don't see any evidence that does anything to tell us how any inefficient the scientific process is at the moment so uh, in challenging you on that what would your reply be to that issue around perceived inefficiency versus actual <coughs> Well, that's really an interesting and intriguing question. Um, my field is biomedical, so I'll give an example from there. Um, maybe four years ago, there was a beautiful article in The Lancet explaining that in clinical research, the proportion of wasteful research was probably 85%, 85%. And the reasoning was that this research that is being done, clinical research, is partly answering irrelevant questions, that's wasteful. Using bad methodology, that's wasteful. Not being reported, then it doesn't exist, that's wasteful. And if it's reported, the reporting quality is awful in many instances, and that makes it wasteful as well. Now you can argue about the percentage, whether it is 85% or whether it's 40%, but it's a pretty strong article that explains that in clinical research, at least, there is a lot of waste and there is room for improvement there. What I'm saying is that we need to think carefully before embarking on research. And that's one of the reasons I'd like the idea of registered reports so much. First think and then do a study. And when it's not useful, don't do it. And when you did a study, always report it and always make everything available and transparent. So in, in many ways what I'm advocating is slow science. Less is more. But once you embark and you have the data, we should be committed 
to do it the right way and to make it available everywhere. Now, now if, if, if you allow me one small anecdote, I, I once told a story about research waste, 85%, for a whole uh, field with funding agency rep representants. And I made them so glad. They said, wow, we could get the same for 15% of the money. And I had to explain a lot to, to reverse that opinion again. It was difficult. Thank you. I think we had another question over here. Uh, Mark Carden, Mosaic Recruitment. Um, in conferences like this, there's a lot of discussion of research methods and, and flawed research and hacking and p-hacking and all the things that need to be uh, fixed in research, very responsible discussions. In the political sphere, there's a lot of discussion about how science is bunk and we don't need to care about knowledge and facts and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm concerned about the these two movements kind of coming together in that you know, a, an irresponsible politician might say, even the scientists admit that science is bunk, rather as people say, well, evolution is just a theory, you admit that, you know, that, that we're almost, by being responsible about the concerns about science, we're feeding the ability of people who are being irresponsible about science to go, aha, yes, even you admit that's a problem. Is there a counter to that? Can we both challenge poor science and yet not hand over to the to the crazies, the notion that science is a complete waste of time. Yeah. I, think both, I think both have to happen because you know, it's not about you know, rooting out poor science, it's about improving the scientific enterprise. You know, having a sound, you know, effective, and uh, you know, research integrity full scientific enterprise is worth having for its own sake. And yes, you know, have airing our internal dirty laundry in public is not the ideal way to go, but in a transparent system, you know, transparency is a double-edged sword. That, you know, you cannot control who will make use of the, the, the falsification, plagiarism practices that are uncovered, but it has to be done. Yeah, I, I fully agree to that. When, when I'm lecturing to scientists, I, I often say, we are living in a, a house of glass. Better get used to it. That's the way it is. People can see everything. And, and they're paying us, so they have the right to see everything. What we need to do is to bring stuff into proportion by explaining how science works. That we make mistakes all the time. And, and that science progresses by making mistakes. And, and when scientists are misbehaving, we need to improve the system, not so much to punish the scientists. It, it's like in healthcare. A, a major revolution in healthcare came from the concept of blame-free reporting. When you see something going wrong, when you say that you made a mistake, you're not being punished, but it, it's used to improve the system and to improve the education. And that's what we need in science as well. People need to be able to talk about their dilemmas, to admit the stuff they don't know, and to explain the wider audience what they are doing and why they are doing it, and, and why it is so difficult doing science, and, and let us please make our mistake, mistakes, because that improves the quality of science in the long run. It's a difficult message, but covering up uh, and, and doing, uh, and, and not admitting errors and mistakes is much worse. Yeah. For instance, in, in research integrity, the, the major thing that happened in the Netherlands, that was our wake-up call, was the Diederik Stapel case in Tilburg University. Worldwide, now Tilburg University uh, is, is recommended for their beautiful behavior. They opened it up, they admitted it, they investigated, and they got their act together. On the last world conference on research integrity, the dean that came after Diederik Stapel, he was dean there as well, had a lecture with the telling title, Never Waste a Good Crisis. And that is what we did. That is what they did. And I think we have time for just one more question over here. Phil? Yeah. Phil Jones from Digital Science. Um, so, Lex, you mentioned a, a couple of things, and, and I think you've addressed them a little bit in the answers as well. Um, one of them was um, incentives and around incentives. The incentives to misbehave are greater than the incentives to behave. 
and another one was around uh, lab culture. And this is something that, uh, that I think is very, very true, rings very true, is that when researchers, particularly more junior or mid-career researchers, are working at doing the actual bench science in their lab, and they take data which perhaps doesn't agree with their hypothesis, and so they do the experiment again until they get the data that does, and they do little p-hackings and little shortcuts, they are vaguely aware that that's not how you're strictly supposed to do it, but everybody else does it, so there's no harm done. And I'm sure I'm right anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And so there is a culture of cutting corners that is absolutely pervasive in many areas of, of research. And like you say, there's incentives to do so. Now, as publishers and in our industry, there's not a lot we can do to directly affect that. To me, the sweet spot lies with tenure committees, promotions committees, and hiring committees in rewarding good behavior and not just focusing on numbers of citations or how many nature papers or whatever. So what can we do as an industry to facilitate that culture change? What role is it that we can play? Uh, beautiful question. Uh, I'm not sure I've got the right answer. Uh, let me first say that, that I fully agree to the fact that culture is really, really dominant. I'm teaching many PhD students and postdocs on, uh, in courses on research integrity. And they always say the same. Uh, this is interesting, this is important, this is relevant, thank you very much. But please come with me and tell it to my boss. Because the culture, the local culture is different. These people are learning that p-hacking is normal in their environment, and they're also learning that when you write a method a section of a, an, an intriguing laboratory experiment, don't get all the details right, because we want to stay ahead of our competitors, which is far removed from transparency, of course. Now, what you can do, maybe, is to, to, to open it up and, and start publishing um, manuscripts when you get them in. Uh, uh, F1000 Research does a good job. A peer Journal does a good job. Th these are really good examples. And don't stop with one cycle of peer review. Do post-publication peer review uh, and encourage young people to participate in that and, and make it accessible for all the readers and users of the stuff you are publishing. That's all quite easy in, in this digital era we, we're living in, and that will enable young people to criticize uh, uh, the stuff in the literature in a constructive way. You, you, always, you all have heard of, of journal clubs. There are in all sciences, you have journal clubs with young investigators, and typically you read together an article from a prestigious journal, uh, and then you find uh, quite often that there is something serious wrong there. I always encourage these people to write a letter to the editor about it. Uh, it's, it's hardly ever published. But when you have a, a system for post-publication peer review, you can help them to make us getting nearer to the, to the truth. Hmm. What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the short answer that came to mind is, well, maybe you collectively should do peer review better because you are the gatekeepers, right? Because the incentive, of course, you have your own incentives. Publishers have their own incentives for only pu publishing, uh, you know, defensible, reproducible, replicable papers. Uh, but you are the gatekeepers for this valuable commodity, uh, which is a publication in one of your journals. Um, and so I know that is very simplistic, uh, and you know, perhaps. You know, the, the, the ideas of you know, open peer review, multiple layers of peer review is more realistic to do. But um, you know, as, a, as a lapsed economist, I mean, I see the incentives for publication distorting the scientific enterprise, not only on the journal, on the investigator side, but also on the journal side. So we are all like, we're caught up in a, in a system with some perverse incentives that are rewarding the wrong things. They're, they're rewarding uh, publications rather than publications that stand the test of time and that are, of course, reproducible and replicable. Um, and, same, and tenure committees are doing the same thing. If you're only counting citations and publications without a regard to how good they are, then 
there's something wrong with that system. That sounds to me like a conversation that's going to run in Oh my God, time. yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, can I first of all please say a huge thanks to Lex and to Kev.